All right, good morning. Come on, let's stand together for the reading of God's Word today. Everybody feeling good? Yeah. Look, look around at some people in your area and say, welcome to church. Welcome to church. I want to invite you to turn your Bibles to Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 23. And as you are doing that, I want to say hello to our amazing online campus. Thank you all for sake, taking some time to worship with us, whether you are watching live or watching this back later. We're so thankful for you and being a part of the Avenue family. Just a, just a couple of hellos that we want to give a shout out to, along with so many more that are watching. I want to say hello to Alex and Jazz. We've got Cheyenne watching with us as well. We've got people from Valdosta, Georgia, and New Orleans, Louisiana. Let's see. And also some people. Let's see. Let's uh, People on I-77, <laughs> and also from, uh, we got people watching from the Florida Georgia line today, so a, a lot of people with us, can you come on, can you help me welcome our online campus, make some noise for them, we love you all. Hey, we're going to dive right in, we ready? Yeah. Come on, 930, we ready today? Yeah. Leviticus chapter 23, we're going to re- revisit 1 and 2, and then we're going to skip to verse 26 and 28, and scripture says, the Lord said to Moses... Speak to the Israelites and say to them, These are my appointed festivals, the appointed festivals of the Lord, which you are to proclaim as sacred assemblies. Verse 26, the Lord said to Moses, verse 27, the tenth day of the seventh month is the day of atonement. Somebody say atonement. Hold a sacred assembly and deny yourselves and present a food offering to the Lord. Do not do any work on that day because it is the day of atonement. Somebody say atonement. When atonement is made before you, before the Lord, your God. All right, if you're a note taker, write this down. The title of the message today is bloodbath. Bloodbath. Come on, look at somebody and say, we need a bloodbath. We need a bloodbath. We need a bloodbath. Let's pray together. Let's also pray for another church as we do every Sunday. God, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Lord, this is the day that you have made, and we're going to rejoice and be glad in it, God. Thank you, Lord, in the midst of all the chaos and all the heartbreak in this region. Lord, you're doing an awesome thing. You are moving and you are working. And so, God, we lean into you during these days. And, God, I thank you for the churches that have rallied together to bring love and to hope, bring hope to people who are going through a difficult time. And, Lord, we just take a moment lift up another church. And, God, today we lift up uh, Newport Church of God. And, God, I thank you for their pastors and their family. Lord, their staff and their leadership and every person at that church. God, I pray you bless them today. Lord, even right now in this moment, will you move in that house? And God, will you change people's lives for your glory, Lord? Thank you for allowing us to be a part of the Capital C Church. And so our prayer is that you would bless the Newport Church of God today. Thank you, Lord, for this house and what you're doing in this place. And Lord, we just give this time to you. Thank you for your presence. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for moving in this place like only you can. And God, thank you for your word in Jesus' name. Come on, somebody say a big amen. 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 You may be seated. All right, so we've been in the book of Leviticus. Anybody been enjoying this series? I hope you've been learning some things during this series, and we've called it Sync, and it's about the Hebrew calendar and the seven major Hebrew festivals, and we've been talking about the significance of these festivals and what they speak to us in 2024, because how many of you know they still speak to us today, right? You see, I I believe it's important for you to understand what Leviticus is about, okay? The name Leviticus means relating to the Levites, The Levites were the family line of Levi, and Aaron from the family of Levi was the first high priest, and it was this family line that became the priest that we read about. Now, Leviticus is a book of instructions regarding the laws, the holiness, the moral codes, and the standards by which the Israelites should live by. So here's what I need you to get. The main theme of Leviticus is how to deal with sin. Okay, the main theme of Leviticus is how to deal with sin. Now, there are different types of sin. There's ignorant sin and there's willful sin. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, don't be ignorant. Ignorant sin is when you don't know that something is wrong and you do it. Willful sin, careful here, is sin when you know something is wrong and you do it anyways. There's a difference. And Leviticus was given to help people know what is expected so we know how to live right and know how to be made right with God if and when we sin. Now, I'm about to rock your world with something right here. We've heard it said that sin is sin. Anybody ever heard that statement? 
sin is sin. But to say that all sin are the same is an inaccurate statement. Follow me. All sins are not the same. There are several, several different terms for sin in Scripture. Let me give you just three of them. Three different terms that is used for sin in Scripture. And, and it looks like this. There's the hata sin, which is when you stray away from the path or you miss the mark. Then this next one is not Avon, like some of you ladies used to sell back in the day, and a box showed up. All right, this is actually Avon. It's crookedness in your behavior. And the root of this word means twisting. Then there's Pesha sin, which is rebellious transgression or trespass. And the root of this word means rebellion. So when you keep looking at it, Hata sin is when you follow the Lord and you make a mistake. Man, I messed up, and I don't know why I did that. You know what I'm talking about. Avon sin is saying that you follow the Lord, but you want to twist the truth to justify what you're doing. Pesha sin means that you follow, you say you follow the Lord, but you're in complete rebellion to his word. I don't care what you say, you can't tell me how to live my life. Let's keep looking at it. Hata sin is ignorance. It's neglecting the truth or a moment of forgetfulness. Avon is deliberately committed and brought on by a sudden weakness. And Pesha is rebellion and you know you're doing wrong. See, the difference in these sins is the intent of the heart. Come on, church. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Church, all sins are not the same. And let me tell you something that pastors who just want to be popular won't tell you. You better be very careful if you're continuing to participate in the sin that you know is wrong. Knowing that you're sinning and the mindset of I'll just ask for forgiveness later will put you on a fast track to hell. I don't like that, Pastor. Well, it's the truth, brother. Come on, touch your neighbor and say, we need to check our hearts. We need to check, we need to check our hearts. This isn't my opinion right here. This is Scripture, Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And Romans 6.23 says, for the consequences or the wages of sin, of that sin is death. I'm telling you this because the Lord gave us instructions and the requirement to finding forgiveness for all of our sins is is, is right here. Here's the requirement. You ready? You ready? Here's the requirement. There has to be bloodshed in order to make atonement. For the sins that you've committed, there has to be bloodshed in order to make atonement. Atonement. Something living must die in order to make atonement. No matter the sin, blood had to be applied in order to make atonement. Leviticus 17, 11. For the life of a creature is in the blood, and I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. Look, it is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. Something living had to give up its life. And the Day of Atonement dealt with all forms of sins committed by the people. The sixth appointed festival on the Hebrew calendar is the Day of Atonement. It takes place at the end of the ten days of all. The Day of Atonement was yesterday. Friday evening at sundown all the way to yesterday evening at sundown. Look, the Day of Atonement is the holiest day of the year. It's not a time of feasting. It's a time of fasting. The only joy came after the atonement. It was the only day the high priest entered into the Holy of Holies, into the presence of God. It was the only day of the year where you could be forgiven of your sins and made right with God. The holiest day of the year. The Day of Atonement is also known as Yom Kippur, or or some would say Yom Kippur. And Yom means day, and Kippur or Kippur means atonement. Look at the definition. Atonement means to cover, 
to cancel, to appease, to forgive, to purge. On the day of atonement, people gathered at the temple. Watch. They haven't eaten. They haven't drank. And they stood with their families for hours and hours in silence, waiting on to see the verdict from the high priest. And we're going to pick it apart today. But waiting, saying nothing for hours. And we want to moan and complain when we do three or four songs on a Sunday. And you stand in an air-conditioned building with lights provided and words provided and soft seats provided. We have the nerve to complain, well, I've got to go to church today. It was an honor for them to wait on the Lord. To wait on the Lord. Why'd they go through all this? Because atonement comes at a price. On the day of atonement in Leviticus chapter 16, 9 and 10, Aaron shall, it says that Aaron shall bring the goat whose lot falls to the Lord and sacrifice it for a sin offering, but the goat chosen by lot as the scapegoat, somebody say scapegoat, shall be presented alive before the Lord to be used for making atonement by sending it into the wilderness as a scapegoat. Now the question is sometimes asked, why do they use goats for this day? What was the significance of the goats? Here's the reason why they use goats, because Israel was linked to deception twice with goats. I don't have time to tell the whole story, but once with Jacob and Esau, a goat was used. And the other with Jacob's son, with Joseph, a goat was used. In both situations, goats were used to deceive, and that's what sin does. Sin deceives us to get us away from God. Can I say it again? Sin deceives us. To get us away from God. So on the day of atonement, God is dealing with sin. So I brought a little friend in with us today. Go ahead and get your awls out. Hey, welcome to Sacrifice Sunday. So watch how this unfolds. The high priest would have two identical goats on the Day of Atonement. One was chosen as the sacrifice, and the other was chosen as a scapegoat. Somebody say scapegoat. So God established a priestly system where animal sacrifices were made. The blood of an animal would be shed so that we could find forgiveness for our sins. Here it is. Something had to die and blood had to be shed for there to be atonement. They're not going to put this up there, but in Leviticus chapter 16, 7 through 10, this is kind of what this describes. The priest would take two goats, and the priest would take them, one to the altar, to sacrifice it and kill it and lay it on the altar. You with me, church? That priest would then wash at what was called the laver, and he would come into the inner courts with the blood. He would make his way eventually into what's called the Holy of Holies. At the mercy seat of God. This was the mercy seat of God. The Ark of the Covenant. There's a lot to that that we can talk about. I don't have the time to tell you. But this was the the mercy seat of God. The Ark of the Covenant. And he would offer the blood of that, that goat from the first goat, from the altar of sacrifice, and sprinkle it on the mercy seat, the Ark of the Covenant, inside the Holy of Holies. And he would spend three hours. Somebody say three. Come on, somebody shout three. Three. He would spend three hours in pitch blackness praying for mercy. And God would then spare us from judgment and we could receive mercy. And once the Lord accepted the sin sacrifice, the priest would then take some of that blood and bring it out to the second living goat And the priest would get some of the blood from the first sacrifice on his hands. And he would place that blood and those hands on the head of that goat. And he would send it off into the wilderness. Never to be seen again. And this goat is signifying that our sins have been taken away. 
These two goats are one in the same. The first goat was for the Lord, and the second goat was for Hazel, translated in the English word as the word scapegoat. The Hebrew word Hazel is broken down in two parts. Oz, which means goat, and Hazel means to go away. The second is the one that was sent away or goes away. Azazel is a word that means for the complete removal. It's where we get the term scapegoat, showing that this sacrifice has taken our sins away. The first goat was for the removal of the guilt of sin, and the second goat removes the presence of sin. There it goes. There it goes. I'm feeling preachy, church. And all of this happened on the Day of Atonement. That happened one time every year. And God says, if you'll do this, I will see the blood and I'll forgive you. All see the parallel avenue. For all have sinned and fallen short. So when Jesus comes on the scene, John the Baptist said in John 1, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus is the Lamb that is sacrificed. And he's also the one who carries our sins sins away. Jesus is the fulfillment of two goats. One, Christ took our sins to the cross, and two, Christ carried away and took away our sin and our guilt, and the only reason why God can forgive us of our sins that we've committed is because of the blood of Jesus that was poured out on the cross, has been accepted, and now applied to our lives. Come on, church, touch your neighbor and tell them we need a bloodbath. We need a bloodbath. And that's why we should be thankful for the blood of Jesus. When we come to Jesus and say that I've sinned, I believe that you are Lord. I confess you in my life. Please forgive me of my sins. Newsflash, Jesus is the sacrifice and we are the ones set free. When God sees the blood that's been applied to your life, he sees the blood and has mercy on you. Psalm 103, verse 10 and 12. He does not deal with us according to our sins. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our sins from us. Jeremiah 31, 34. I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sins no more. So Isaiah 53, 4. Surely he took upon our pain and he bore our suffering. 2 Corinthians 5, 20 for God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Jesus Christ. Oh, surely there's some safe folk up in here today who's thankful for the blood that was shed to wash away our sins. Because of Jesus, we can receive mercy and find grace in our time of need. Come on, somebody give God a big shout of praise today. Woo! Come on, high five somebody and tell them the blood changed my life. The blood changed my life. Are we okay, church? Come on, online, talk to me. The blood changed my life. Are we good? But if only the high priest was able to get into the holy of holies, to get to mercy, how can you and I get there today? The Day of Atonement we're talking about in Leviticus. How does that apply to us today in 2024? Can I preach today? Let me give you two things. Number one, write this down. Atonement gives you personal access into the presence of a holy God. I would have thought the whole church would have shouted right there. You You know why you didn't? Because this is an Eastern book, and we live in a Western society. Yeah, 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 come on. Yeah, we live in a Western society where we think everything's about us. Well, what's, this, what's, this, what's, what's in it for me? What you going to tell me today? What, what's, it's all, you're, on, I'm on, you're on my time now, and what, what are you going to do for me? And I want something for me, and what's in it for me? When this ain't got nothing to do. This, this book is about him. And how we should live our lives for him. And how we should sacrifice for him. And how we should give up for him. This is an eastern book in the middle of a western society. It's 
So I want to say it again. Number one, atonement gives you personal access into the presence of a holy God. It's a little, it's a little better. It's a little better. It's a little better. See, once the sacrifice has been made, the priest would then wash what's called the laver. I told you that a second ago, to prepare, to prepare to go into the inner court and eventually make his way into the Holy of Holies. He would step up to a thick veil that separated the inner court from the Holy of Holies. See, the veil is what separated man from God's presence. Only the high priest could go past the veil into the Holy of Holies, into God's presence. This is about to be so good. This is about, I'm going to preach this thing. I'm going to be happy whether you're happy or not. The high priest would come into the Holy of Holies at the mercy seat, at the Ark of the Covenant, and would spend three hours in pitch blackness praying for mercy. Why are you excited about three hours? Why are you excited about it? After three hours, the presence of God would show up, and smoke would rise from the altar. And showing the priest that God's presence had shown up and God had accepted the blood for forgiveness. The priest would then take that blood and go out to the other scapegoat like I just showed you. Cover it with blood and the blood and then set it free. And then he would go and wash. He would change clothes and watch this. He would come out to the people who had been waiting there for hours. Waiting because it had been a whole year. They were waiting for the verdict. And right there in that moment, the high priest would step up and say to the people, it is finished. Hebrews chapter 9, 11 and 12. But when Christ came as high priest of the good things that are now already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made with human hands. That is to say, is not a part of this creation. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the holy of holies, the most holy place, once for all by his own blood. Thus obtaining eternal redemption. All oh, see a church. Jesus was crucified on a cross. And there on that cross as the sacrifice for our sins, he cried out to the Father and declared in John 19 verse 30, it is finished. Then he breathed his last breath. He died on that cross, and in a moment, he passed through the heavens. And the Bible says that at that moment, the ground began to shake, and the veil of the temple that separated me and you from the Holy of Holies was split in two. They placed him in a tomb. That was day one. He stayed down. That was day two. Remember, the high priest spent three hours in the Holy of Holies before the sacrifice was accepted when Jesus died. Oh, it was on the third day that he rolled the stone away and got back up and presented himself to the world, declaring my grace has been sufficient. My blood has paid the price. It is finished. I need you to tell your whole area it's finished. It's finished. It's finished. It's finished. It's finished. It's finished. Come on online. Talk to me. It's finished. I've come to tell somebody no longer do you need a priest to go to God for you, but because of Jesus, the veil has been removed, and now you can boldly approach the throne of grace to receive mercy. Oh, come on, Avenue. When Jesus said it's finished, the very thing that's been trying to destroy you no longer has power over you. That addiction that's been trying to kill you is finished that depression that's been trying to take you out it's finished that fear that's been trying to ruin you it's finished sin no longer has control over you it's finished Jesus finished the work of the cross 
so you can have access to God and step into his presence and find freedom and joy and forgiveness and hope and strength and victory for your life. Oh, come on. Now would be a good time for about a 15 second praise break because you're thankful for the blood of Jesus. Woo! Come on, somebody give God a shout of praise today. I need you to get up and high five seven people and tell them well, you need a bloodbath. You need a bloodbath. Come on online, talk to me. You need a bloodbath. Anybody glad that because of Jesus, there's no power in hell that can stand against God's presence in your life? Somebody shout because hell has been defeated. Woo! Let me, let me skip the second one. So atonement gives you personal access into the presence of a holy God. Here's how the second way that this speaks to us today. Number two, atonement gives you freedom from the sin that makes you guilty. Gives you access into the presence of a holy God. And atonement gives you freedom. Somebody shout freedom. freedom. From the sin that makes you guilty. Can I keep preaching? Yes. Are we okay? Yes. Leviticus 16, 7 through 10. He's to take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting. He's to cast lots for the two goats. One for the Lord and the other for scapegoat. Aaron shall bring the goat whose lot falls to the Lord and sacrifice it for a sin offering. But the goat chosen by lot as the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to be used for making atonement by sending it into the wilderness as a scapegoat. Now let's fast forward to the time when Jesus was arrested. He's about to make atonement for the whole world. He's been arrested. John chapter 18. Pilate brings him out and says, what is truth? And with this, he went out again to the Jews, gathered there and said, I find no basis for a charge against this Jesus. But it is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of the Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? They shouted back, no, not him. Give us Barabbas. Whew. Verse 40 in the New King James Version says, now Barabbas was a robber. And if you take a minute and zoom out from this scene in John chapter 18, you can see Leviticus 16, the temporary system, taking place right before your eyes. You've got Jesus and Barabbas. Follow me, church. You've got this Jesus, the Lamb of God, standing next to Barabbas, the proven criminal. One will be sacrificed and the other set free. So Pilate says, I know it's your custom to release a prisoner on Passover. So what do you want me to do? And here we have Jesus, the Son of God, and Barabbas, a known criminal. Watch this, church. Barabbas is actually referred to in Matthew chapter 27, verse 17, as Jesus Barabbas. Barabbas' name means the son of a father. We don't even really know who this guy is. Just the son of a father. We've got Jesus the Christ, the son of God, son of the father, and Jesus Barabbas, the criminal son of a father. And Pilate says, which Jesus do you want? Come on, see it. Which goat do you want? Barabbas, he's a rebel. He's broken the law. 
Many, many times. The Bible calls him a robber, which is translated as an insurrectionist, which means that he was a murderer. He's a disgusting person. He, deser- he deserves to be crucified. And they call for Barabbas to be set free, and they want Jesus, the Son of God, to be crucified. Why? What did he ever do to even deserve any of that? All he's ever done is heal and love, deliver and teach and restore. And they shout, no, give us Barabbas. Crucify Jesus. And they arrest an innocent Jesus and charge him as a criminal, and they set Barabbas free. And then we don't hear from Barabbas again. Not even a thank you. Nothing. Barabbas has been convicted for his sins and has given the death sentence and he deserves it. Yet without even deserving mercy, he discovers that Jesus is going to die instead. Barabbas woke up on a Friday morning expecting nothing but a slow, horrible death. And by the time the end of the day comes, he's at home with his family to celebrate the Sabbath. Come on, get this, church. We are clearly intended to see ourselves in this Barabbas, destined for death, but finding freedom and life through the death of a Savior. Jesus was found guilty of nothing, so you could be innocent of everything. Oh, my goodness. And there stands Jesus, the king of the universe, knowing that God had to treat Jesus like a criminal so he could treat Barabbas like a son. And it hasn't changed. God had to crucify Jesus like a criminal so he could love you like his family. Jesus, the Lamb of God, is taken away to be sacrificed while Barabbas is set free. People did not set Barabbas free. God had already planned this thing out. It had to happen this way. And when you zoom out from this scene, we realize that we are Barabbas. Jesus took our place so we could be set free. We're the ones that truly deserve a criminal's punishment, but Jesus took our place, and that's why the Day of Atonement is the holiest day of the year. Jesus took our place so we could be forgiven. Please hear me, church. And knowing all that Jesus did for us, if you've made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, how dare we treat sin like a light thing? And that's the problem we have in the U.S. and the Western culture today. You want to know why America's in shambles? I'll tell you why. S-I-N. No, it's, it's, it's Trump's fault. No, it's Harris's fault. No, it's Biden's fault. No! Sin! Yeah, but God's grace is so amazing. Just grace, grace. I want to slap. I'm trying to be careful. I want to slap the devil out of the people who have spread this whole grace movement across our nation. Oh, just, it's just grace. It's okay, just grace. Grace will cover it. Past, present, future, grace is all. Just go live however you want. Grace is good. God's grace. God's grace. Oh, God's grace. Just live. That's a bunch of bull crap. Read the book. How dare we treat sin like a light thing? What a slap in our Savior's face. To know what we're doing is wrong and continue to do it anyways because we're so selfish in our desires. 
That's why families are going to hell. That's why our America needs revival because it's going to hell. The pastors who just want to grow their church won't tell you that. I'll tell you that because I'd rather you go to heaven and split hell wide open. Hebrews 4, 16. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy. You know what mercy is? It's not getting what you do deserve. So you can get mercy and find grace. That's getting what you don't deserve. To help us in our time of need. You need to understand something to do. Grace is not provided so you can continue in your sin and live however you want. Grace is there so if you do sin, you can come to God and find mercy to be set free from your sin. Don't tell me. Don't tell me you're following Jesus and you've repented when you've turned around and you're doing the same stuff you was doing before. You ain't following Jesus, you're following yourself. You just feel better about it. The cross was the most brutal and horrific moment in the history of the world. And Jesus was crucified on the cross so you could be atoned by his sin. It's my sin and it's your sin that caused him to die. And who do we think we are just to walk out of here and go, oh, it's okay. You made some mistakes. You're going to make a lot more. Just ask for grace. What are you saying to Jesus? Ephesians 1, 7. He's so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, for God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sins so that we can be made right with God through Christ. And in 2024, I've come to tell the whole world the blood of Jesus has never lost its power. The blood takes away our sin. It's the blood that sets you free. It's the blood that takes away your shame. It's the blood that wipes away the stain from your past newsflash. The blood gets you out of hell and gives you a place in heaven and in a world that has lost its mind to social agendas and demonic influences and Hollywood Satanists and political correctness the blood of Jesus is still the answer to a hurting world what can wash away my sin nothing but the blood of Jesus what can make me whole again nothing but the blood of Jesus Come on, church, somebody give God a praise because you're thankful for the blood of Jesus. Come on, come on, stand with me and tell some people in your area you need a bloodbath. You need a bloodbath. Hey, church, hear this pastor's heart. Don't you dare walk out these doors and start committing willful sin. My Jesus is worth more than that. The problem is, America has labeled this thing called Christianity, convenient Christianity. Pull, you'll pull it out at funerals and Everybody goes to heaven. Somebody going through a bad time. Oh, everybody's going to pray for you. You ain't talked to God in a year. Well, I need help on a test or I need help in this. And I know I'll call on God because he's going to give me what I want. Western. It, it, would, it would behoove you to learn the Eastern culture. It would, it, would, it would benefit your life greatly to understand Jewish culture and what they were raised to follow and sacrifice and give up. How many of you have had to ask for forgiveness for the same thing?
how dare you leave this place today and return back to your own vomit and just say, ah, I'll just ask for forgiveness later. We've got to grow up. When I, when I mess up, because I'm human, it breaks my heart. I, I'm so like, I'm devastated. It bothers me for days. Why? Because I think, I think about Jesus. I think about my own kids. It feels my, it feels my own kid. Could I do this for them? And then I think about Jesus who did this knowing, knowing that people would reject it. Ah. I gotta finish this thing. G- give me, give me, give me a minute. I gotta finish this. Luke, Luke 23, 42 and 43. We, we come, we come to find out that there's two other criminals crucified with Jesus. You, you know, Barabbas was supposed to be in the middle. That was supposed to have been Barabbas. You know, that was his posse that was getting crucified with. We find ourselves in Barabbas, but we also see ourselves in the other criminal next to Jesus. This is about to, this, what I'm about to tell you is going to mess up every doctrine. It's going to mess up every denomination. It's going to mess up every theology. You ready? Verse 42, the criminal said, Jesus, remember me. That's it. No growth track. No, no ABC prayer. No, no knowledge of like nothing. Like just, hey, will you remember me? Jesus said, today, today, you will be with me in paradise. <laughs> can you imagine? Can can you imagine when this criminal showed up in heaven? What are you doing here? How did you get here? Can you imagine this criminal's answer? I have no idea. But the man in the middle said I could come. Woo! Hey church, if the criminal hanging next to Jesus can make it to heaven, you can too. Let, let, me, let me land this. Let me land this. It's 1101. Let me land this. I feel like running right here. The Day of Atonement. Somebody say atonement. There are 365 days in a year. It's nothing earth shattering. And the Day of Atonement was the one day. Somebody say one day. It was the one day where we could receive forgiveness for our sins and be made right with God. It is the holiest day of the year on the Hebrew calendar. Please watch this. Please watch this. I'm not making this stuff up. This is so good. The name given for the devil in Hebrew is Hasatan, which is translated as the Satan. We just simply say Satan. Now, I've shown you many times throughout the years that the Hebrew alphabet is alphanumeric, meaning that every letter has a number associated with it, and those values have meaning. Means something to us. The name Hasatan, the Satan, means the adversary, and the numerical value is 364. 
I feel like shouting, Elder Rob. For 364 days out of the year, the devil thinks he has power to accuse us for all of our sins. And the Jews believe that the day of atonement is the one day that hell is silenced and his power fails. And I've come to tell the whole world when we come to God and get a bloodbath and get covered by the blood of Jesus, there is no power in hell strong enough to keep us from the love of God. There is no power in hell strong enough to stand against the blood of Jesus. Oh, I've come to tell you that all of hell is rendered powerless because of the miracle working power of the blood of Jesus. Here's the big idea. God sent his son to become the ultimate sacrifice for sin. It's because of the blood of Jesus that we have the hope of heaven. Hey church, the blood has never lost its power. Eleven oh six. Jesus in flesh is in heaven seated at the right hand of the Father the Holy Spirit is here God the Father God the Son God the Holy Spirit it's eleven oh six. there's a few famous people in this world today that if they were here today some of y'all would be lining up just to get a picture with them get an autograph for just a minute if you could just envision the one who shed his blood so that we could have the hope of heaven for four minutes for four minutes what would you do what would you do for four minutes what would you do go go What would you do? I hope I hope you can see why it's the holiest day of the year. Oh. Hey church, you cannot walk out of here today and just continue in your willful sin. Can I give you the best advice anybody could ever give you? You want to change your life? Obviously, obviously, Jesus. That's that's in the book. Read the book. Do what it says. (laughs) Now, now in in the process of that, listen. There, there are going to be some things you're going to come across that like no more pork and like that stuff. Like you got to, you got to figure that stuff out. Like that, that, that kind of stuff no longer applies. You can have a barbecue pork sandwich. How, how do I know that? Well, Jesus, Jesus talked about that in the New Testament. Hey. Some, there's some people in this room, you've been living in willful sin and you know it. You, you've been living that. And, and I want to pray, listen, I want to pray with anybody who's never given their life to Christ. And I also want to pray with the person who you've drifted away from God because of willful sin. And today you need to recommit your life to follow Jesus. Because if I'm going to follow Jesus, 
oh, I'm going to do everything in my power to, to not mess up. Not because it's do's and don'ts, but because I love him so much. So all over this house and online, if you're here today, head up, eyes open, okay? There's no shame in this house. No shame. There's no shame. No pointing fingers in this house. We celebrate with people who get things right with God in this house, okay? So there, there's no shame. There's nothing about, oh, I don't want to raise my hand. No, no, no. We, this, praise God. Praise God. I'm going to count to three if that's you. And you say, Pastor Justin, include me in that prayer. I need to get some things right with God today. On the count of three, I just want you to lift that hand up with boldness right here, okay? One, there's our, yeah, one. You, you don't have to wait. Two. Come on. Three, come on, yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you, yeah, praise God, come on, right back here, right here, right here, praise God, maybe somebody online as well, praise God, hey, I'm proud of you, proud of you, proud of you, thank you, come on, let's, let's pray together, those of you who raised that hand, I want you to pray this from your heart and your mouth, Avenue, let's join them, I want you to say, God, I need you. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for your son, Jesus. I need a bloodbath. Thank you for the blood today. Jesus, I confess, you are Lord. Forgive me of my sins. I plead the blood of Jesus. And from this day forward, no matter what, I'm not running from you. I'm following after you. You are my savior. In Jesus' name. Come on, somebody shout an amen. If this message spoke to you today and you took your next step of making a decision to know Christ, we want to celebrate with you and walk this out with you. Simply click the link in the comments below and a pastor will reach out to you and celebrate the greatest decision you have ever made. At The Avenue, we know that we're stronger together, everyone matters, and you belong here.